Okay. Good morning, everybody. I hope people survived the dinner last night. And obviously, people didn't go drinking with very, but apart from those who were not here, the rest of the people didn't go drinking for the rest of the evening. It's a pleasure to welcome all to you, Bob, from the Harry Potter University of Edinburgh, talking to us about equations and groups, formal languages, and complexity. Uh, all right, well, thank you very much. Uh, maybe I'll thank the organizers later, maybe. Um, when they arrive. When they arrive. <laughs> 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 thank you for sure. Um, so yeah, postpone them, maybe. I don't know. Um, so, um, all right, so my talk will have um, uh, three parts. One will be an overview, very general, to those new to the area, not to the specialists. Then there will be a very computer science in middle that I hope you will stick with uh, and not switch off. Some, some people get scared by some of the things that I say. And at the end, um, just to make everybody happy, I'll, I'll have some pure group theory that I hope people can relate to. Um, all right, so this should work. Right, so I'll start with a very basic, uh, it just equations in group, some, some examples. Um, my groups will be um, discrete and infinite. Um, so um, if you have such a group G and a uh, number of variables, x1 to xn, and equations is exactly what you think it should be. It's a formal expression consisting of these variables with some coefficients in the group G. Uh, and you're setting this expression equal to 1. Um, so um, without knowing, Perhaps you've been solving equations your whole life in any groups or in any other algebraic structure. So if you're in a group and you wonder are there roots uh, of your element, that, that is an equation. Here I have simply the free group on two generators. I'm asking if one of the generators is a square. Of course it's not. It's a free group. But this is an equation in one variable, a very simple one. Uh, another equation that you solve all the time, I think many of you do, uh, is the conjugacy problem. Right. So you, you have two elements. Here I have a, B, and B, A, and you're asking are they conjugate? Well, that's the same as asking is there an element X such that this is satisfied? Uh, in this case, I think everybody, uh, well, it's the first uh, course in an infinite groups, uh, A, B, R is conjugate to A, and it's like the permutation is, and it's easy to tell who conjugates them. So this is another one variable, very simple. Something more interesting, something that I really like, it's uh, one of the first interesting equations in, in free groups, I would say. What if you are, so you're still in the free group on two letters, A and B, and you're taking the commutator of A and B here, and you're asking, uh, for which variables, X and Y, do I have their commutator equal to the standard commutator? So obviously you have the, the trivial solution, but you have a lot more. So anything like this is a solution for any n, right? There's cancellations, and then you get what, what you have here, the commutator. But you can also switch things, and you have another infinite family of solutions. And there's more families of solutions. You can get them all from needs and transformations. It's a very basic automorphism of the free group. Um, and this is, uh, it takes, I don't know, half a page to a page. It, it takes some thinking to get all the solutions, show that there are all the solutions. But there's something special about it. You don't need any big guns, any big machinery. You can actually do it uh, with some effort, um, so, so sort of on the spot. Uh, and I'll get back to such equations. They're very important. They're called quadratic equations. All right, now, um, even if semigroups sum by their name to be half as good as groups, this is what one of my colleagues in semigroup theory says all the time, uh, semigroups are, 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 are equally good. Uh, so. Um, if you want to solve an equation there, obviously you can just set uh, something equal to one, you just set two expressions equal to each other. And you, I'm, I'm bringing this up just because solving uh, equations in mono or free mono, it would be very much equivalent to solving equations in free groups, in what I'm going to say later. Okay, so this is, uh, although uh, historically semigroups are looked at earlier than groups, um, that, they are, um, that there's not a big discrepancy there. All right, so anytime you have equations, could be any area of mathematics, there are two natural questions. One is, uh, does your equation have solutions? And, well, I really want to state it as a decision problem, not just that. So is there an algorithm which, given an equation, um, decides if there are solutions for an equation? So we can also say, is that equation satisfiable? Uh, and, of course, the, the, the bigger question is, describe, understand, uh, deal with the solutions. 
for any satisfied population. So these are uh, called, uh, there's a, a specific name, the affronting problems, as, as you might think from, from equations of integers. I'm using the, um, the questions a bit more loosely than that, so I won't use exactly that, but uh, you especially, it's how, that's how they, they call this. All right, so these are the questions. What are some of the answers? Uh, well, as you can imagine, uh, you can solve equations in groups or monoids in general because you can solve the conjugacy problem in lots of time, right? Uh, however, you don't need to go, I mean, for me, groups with unsolvable, say, word or conjugacy problem are fairly esoteric. Not for somebody like Maurice who gave the first course and that's his bread and butter. But um, if you can find unsolvable equations much closer to home in important groups, so already in most important groups you cannot solve systems of equations. So there's a lot of uh, interesting things to be said there, but that's because you can encode the, the, the affronting uh, equations or equations over the integers into important groups. Uh, now, the first uh, breakthrough, the first positive results were about free groups and free semi-groups, really. This was late 70s, early 80s. Uh, so, Makani's algorithm uh, for free semi-groups and then um, free groups was about decidability, is the uh, solution. Um, very difficult algorithm. Uh, in terms of complexity, already the complexity was something like the Ackermann function. So, the time complexity, the space complexity was exponential space. Um, but there's something else to be said. I think a lot of the people who do serious computation here have algorithms with very tricky complexity, but they can still do things at an implementation level. Well, in our case, we still don't have 40 years later um, algorithms that can solve equations. There's been some attempts, especially recently, uh, but we, we don't have a, 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 you know, something that, that you can write in a computer and, and, and get solutions. So I think that, that says even more about the difficulty of the problem. Um, now, since then, um, there's been a lot of, uh, of work, and I'm mentioning very, very, uh, well, not very little, but, but only some of it. So if you stick to groups that are not very far from the geometric point of view, which uh, you can think of as hyperbolic, or relatively hyperbolic, uh, you can solve equations. This is some um, beautiful work in, and, uh, in, in all the things that I'm mentioning here. So very interestingly, the hyperbolic notion free hyperbolic was done in the 90s by Rips and Sella. And then the, all the hyperbolic cases, so all the hyperbolic groups are done later. And one of the, the, the tricky, very tricky issues was going from free groups to virtually free groups. So that's another thing that's very interesting. Uh, for geometers, saying virtually something means nothing, right? It's a geometric property. But in this area, virtually something is actually a tricky point. All right, then a different approach, different kind of direction is if you look at partially commutative or right angle wrapping groups. Um, we can solve equations there, very different approach. And also, um, in this direction, uh, solving equations is close undertaking free products and uh, direct products and modular graph products. Okay. So there's, again, as I said, there's more to be said, but these are sort of the, the, the key results. Um, and, well, because, uh, well, this conference, there's obvious connections to logic, and just for pedagogical reasons, I, I talked about equations, but you can very well talk about inequations, right, where you have not equal to, and you can talk about systems and solving various systems, and then you're talking about the existential theory of a group. Okay, so everything I really said on the previous slide is about can be said about the existential theory. So there's <coughs> there's just to take it easy in the morning after the beer and the pizza and so. On. All right, so um, another connection to geometry, well, we saw already Monday, Tuesday, that there's very important deep connections to geometry in terms of JSJ decompositions, which could be automorphism and so on. Uh, this is more basic ge geometry, but nevertheless very beautiful, uh, mostly uh, stemming from a paper of color where the idea is to understand quadratic equations in, in, in three groups. So things like exactly like what I showed you Quadratic equations are, are things like, uh, well, several products of commutators or products of squares. So here it's related to understanding curves on surfaces and looking at very nice maps. Um, and again, there's, there's a way to solve these equations that doesn't require all the mechanisms or technology or other very um, difficult algorithms. Um, and another connection that I must say, I, uh, 
I tried to read <coughs> and I don't see how much more there is. So in computers, the theoretical computer science is a big area called unification theory, which is about essentially solving equations in three lines. Uh, and it has real applications. It, it sort of um, strings of things where you need to unify it to the three expressions. And I'm not sure how much more beyond solving equations in three lines there is. So um, I, uh, I've been reading and I, I, I uh, that's not, uh, it's just uh, an important part, but uh, I'm not an expert on that. All right, so now moving on to the, the more computer science part. Um, right, we talked about decidability. Now, what about solutions? So, there's, a, let's say, an algebraic approach, which is very important, and uh, it's, it's trying to use, so it's expressing the solutions in terms of Macan and Rasborg diagrams. It's beyond the scope of this talk to tell you what Macan and Rasborg diagrams are. Um, but it is, well, I will say just that there are graphs where you have uh, groups and vertices and um, um, group homomorphism or automorphism on the edges. And following those, those maps, you, you get the solutions. This will be relevant for what I'm saying in, in the algorithms later. So in, in any case, this is, uh, these are very important uh, objects to work with, also very hard to get for uh, explicit equations. So we have them for explicitly computed in very few cases. Um, so then uh, there's been a lot of work by many, uh, many authors which I'm not listing here for, for some of the other groups where we know decidability. And, and uh, it's, as was mentioned on Monday, there's uh, now Macan Rasborg diagrams for semi-groups as well. Uh, and uh, again, other, other classes of groups, there's been some uh, attempts to create such diagrams. Uh, now, my approach is not, um, well, not that, or my interest has been uh, more to think of, them, of the solutions differently. So if you think of a free group, well, how do you write elements in a free group? They're just words on some alphabet, right? So when you have words on an alphabet, that's a language. Of however, whatever you think a language should be, but it's, you can imagine right, that it is a language. So uh, in computer, theoretical computer science, the question has been floating for a while, well, what is the, the language type of the solution set uh, in a free group? And the conjecture was that uh, the type should be indexed, and we were able to prove that. Um, and I'll you know, say a bit about languages. Um, it's going to be a crash course in two minutes of what computer science students take for a semester. So uh, famously, Chomsky uh, in the 60s tried to understand the syntax of spoken languages, such as English and German, uh, in terms of grammars. So when I mean languages, I don't mean each word, mom, dad, bread, uh, I mean the sentence, right? So how can we generate a sentence uh, where your basic objects are words? Okay, so not necessarily letters. And so uh, his uh, main types were regular context-free, context-sensitive, I believe recursive, numerable, recursive. So um, I want to say regular are the easiest kind, are the ones that you want to have, they're context-free as well. Uh, what is a regular language? It's just one that if you have a finite graph uh, with particular, so with, with uh, a start point and some final point and various things uh, in between, of course uh, it doesn't have to be such a simple, but let's say you have A, B, A or something uh, and various, various other things going on. The language uh, that you can read off such a label, finite graph, is just start here and read all the labels, so something like A, A, B, A is, is a word in the language. So if your language can be read off such a little graph, then it's regular. Uh, Context-free are also, they appear all the time when you're late taking and you get their messages. That's because there's a context-free, there's a compiler in there telling you you forgot the parentheses. Okay, so context-free are very useful. They're also very quick to work with. Uh, inside a computer. So these are the kind of things that are used and we like to work with because they're fast and membership things are nice to deal with. Uh, as you move uh, away, context sensitive, it's already a bit too general. And then of course recursively enumerable is what the Turing machine produces, so good luck with that. Um, so now the, the class of languages that I'm interested in is somewhere here, right? So that's the index one. I won't tell you what index is. Uh, 
because it wouldn't be very helpful, but I will tell you something in, in this direction. Uh, and let me just say for those of you who uh, know a bit about languages, it's very easy to tell that uh, uh, the solutions of uh, an equation, sorry, I didn't know I need to work out more for this. Okay. So uh, if you have something like that, x equals y, the solution essentially would be something of this form, u and u. And it turns out that the language of such word is not context-free. That's sort of a basic pumping lemma for context-free languages. So we know already we cannot be in context-free. And it's a sort of an easy exercise, if you know something about languages, to show that it's definitely context-sensitive. So the question is, what is it in between? And incidentally, I want to say that the, the two people who I think were most influential in bringing formal languages to groups are here in the room, Bob, uh, Wilman, and Oshuk. So, are you okay with taking credit? <laughs> so, um, uh, Bob, uh, I think, has a few, the first papers uh, sort of introducing index languages to group theory. They are not, as I put them sort of in this dotted line also because they're not due to Chomsky. They, they came up a bit later in the 70s due to Aho, so it's a different thing. And also for fun, uh, so, so again, the German organizers are not here. Uh, so Chomsky tried to understand if spoken languages are context-free. That was his hope. Turns out there's a, there's a, a Swiss-German dialect from Luzern where you can prove it's not context-free. So it's a very nice. I can tell you about it. Uh, but uh, moving on. All right, so um, how do we represent the solutions? Well, going back to that equation that I showed you at first, well, it write x and y, and there are pairs of things you can you can either write them as, as just a comma b, but I would write them as, as a some symbol b. So I just split them, I just separate the, the things in the top of by a symbol that is not in my initial alphabet. So um, so that's how you uh, how you should imagine them. I mean, they're not going to be tacos, they're literally going to be words over a bigger alphabet. And of course, uh, it's what, what you've seen on Monday, Tuesday, that's... When we really talk about solutions, we think about homomorphism. So if you have such an equation, a solution is just a homomorphism from the free group on your variables together with the constants into the free group, right? It's just a substitution uh, of variables by words, and you want to make the left side and the right side. So really, that's how you should write them formally. Uh, and so then, actually, a solution looks like that. So it's, it's a substitution for x1 with the hash and, and, and so on to the substitution for the last variable. So now the, uh, the theorem uh, says that um, if you have a free group, a solution, again, I'll write it as a homomorphism. Uh, it turns out that the set of solution in reduced words, so written like this, is an index language. Uh, there's a lot to be said about this blue reduced <laughs> word. Um, it's relatively easy to get them as unreduced words. I'll show you why, maybe you're wrong. Hopefully it's going to become obvious, but getting them as reduced words is very tricky. And again, for those who know a bit about languages, if you have a regular language and you want to look at the reduced words equal to regular language, that's regular and nice. When you move on to context-free already, just taking the reduction, free reduction, you are not context-free anymore. So free reduction does not work for higher classes. Uh, it takes a lot more work to show things uh, about languages that are, uh, if you want them to be reduced. Okay, so that's a language part. Now there's an algorithmic part, uh, which says that to get uh, the solutions, you need a, a finite graph. You're going to read them off, and to create this finite graph, um, it's it's uh, non-deterministic uh, quasi well, so non-deterministic space and log n, where n is the size of the equation. Uh, as, as computer scientists call it, as a non-deterministic quasi-logarithmic space. Um, and the point is that you can start with some symbol and decide what, what, what you want, and then you follow morphisms in this graph, and, uh, and you can read off the solutions as reduced words. So um, there's a lot to be said here. My, my co-authors would definitely talk a lot about this part, which is definitely uh, well, the more important part. Um, they're, they're more interested in complexity. I love the language theory result because I think well, it's the beauty of mathematics, finding structure in complex things like 
uh, non-algebraic variety. So I'm going to talk about more, more about languages. Uh, may I ask you yeah. Quick question. Uh, yeah. The index languages they are stable under intersections or no? Are oh, they are not? Mm -hmm. So in this theorem, it's one equation and no more than one. Ah, no, no. So we we, we put the uh, oh, systems together okay. in. I mean, we put yeah. it, we have it's it's. So yeah, but again, I'm simplifying a lot of stuff, but it's, it's all, there's also constraints and systems, there's a lot more going on, but this is the easy, easier version. And you deal with the systems in the process, uh, it's not just an intersection. Yeah. Okay, so, um, but I wanted to say something uh, about, well, how did we get here? Uh, so while in mathematics there was an approach following Macanula's borough diagrams and sort of going to more complicated groups, in computer science uh, the interest has been somewhat orthogonal. Uh, if you ask different questions, you're probably going to do different things. So they were more interested in, in, in uh, space complexity than time complexity, which for me is a bit unnatural as a mathematician. Um, but there's been, as you see, a lot of work on decidability in increased semigroups. So moving from exponential space in Macan to polynomial space, and then uh, free groups, and then uh, free groups of constraints. I'll tell you more about that. And then, uh, this should have been, ah, uh, here it's been. Um, and then Artur Riesch uh, simplified all of these things with some clever uh, compression of strings and then recompression and recompression. Um, and, then, um, and then finally, in 2014, there's an algorithm now that produces the solutions uh, with rational constraints in, in, in free groups. Um, now, so we used this, this line of work uh, but we, we had to still uh, change this algorithm quite a lot because in what Yesh does, uh, in his algorithms, he does a lot of work and then suddenly he says, oh, and I'm going to solve some linear equations here and then I'm going back. And so if you want to come up with words on an alphabet, solving some equations over the integers is not really, um, you know, it's hard to, <laughs> to mix the, the, the two. So, uh, but anyway, it's, it's, it's based on this line of research. Um, and uh, as I said, uh, we had to do that for get, to get the language description. So this is where, don't run away, please. So the language, I said it's indexed, but it's better than that. It's something called EDTOL. So as you know, in computer science, they love acronyms. That says, stands for Extended Deterministic Table of Zero Interaction in the Mind. Okay. So, <laughs> Uh, it's not as esoteric as you might think, so let me tell you a bit about this language. It's, it's a language that comes, that's part of the um, Lindemeyer family. So in the 60s, again, this was the, 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 the era of Chomsky coming up with, with grammars to do things. So Lindemeyer uh, came up with grammars, so <laughs> sort of thinking about biology, trying to mimic the growth of organisms. So if you know a bit about context-free grammars, what you do there is you say, oh, let me substitute, I have this word, I'm going to substitute A by B, C, like this A, and then you do not make another step, oh, let me substitute this A again by B, C. So you sort of, it's a sequential process. But if you think of plants, they don't grow one leaf today and one leaf tomorrow, right? It's all done in parallel. So the idea of Lindemann was like, we need to, 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 to do things in parallel, and so he came up with uh, with, with this uh, class of, of grammars and languages. So his idea was to understand uh, growth of plants in biology. It turns out that maybe didn't go very far. However, these things are used nowadays in computer graphics uh, quite a lot because, as you can imagine, you want to, to draw things that grow in a particular way. So that's my verbal moment, the, the moment of advertisement. Um, but let me say a bit what they are. So these are the whole big class of the languages. The idea is to have, uh, I mean, a, sort of a simplistic way of saying this. You have some symbol like like the dollar, and then you apply morphisms to it. So again, if you're an algebraist, you think, well, what's the big deal in, in doing things in parallel? That's a homomorphism. You're just when you substitute a, right? You don't do it once at a time. You do it in everywhere in the world. And essentially, this is what they are. It's applying homomorphisms, but with a lot of bells and whistles and, and extra flexibility. Okay, so it's essentially having a symbol and applying a, a regular family of morphisms to it. And again, flexibility with the alphabets, so you play with that. But at the basic level, this is what they are. Um, and again, going back to my picture, so I have context-free languages 
I had index languages, which I can tell what they are, but it turns out that it is edit or something like that. So they're much smaller than all of the index, and they intersect with, uh, well, a bit with, with complex frame. Um, and again, for those of you who uh, know a bit about languages, I said that already um, this language is not context free. Now, let me show that it is in this EDTOL class um, and with an example. So, I have an alphabet A and a slightly bigger one. This is my extra symbol that I play with. And here are a bunch of maps. So, these are um, uh, semi group maps, just substitutions of words. Okay, so I'm uh, mostly working with the, with the hash. If I don't say anything else, it means that the other letter, letters are being fixed. Um, and so what do you do to get this language, U, followed by U? Well, it turns out you should take, right, so again, uh, regular languages means there's some regular expression, something you can write easily with sets, right, um, so concatenation and so on. So if you take just a map followed by any, anything in here, followed by this map, and apply it to the hash symbol with a bit of playing around is you get exactly this language you do. Okay, so it's really applying morphisms and also making the, putting a condition at the very end that whatever you get, you only keep the things in the alphabet A. So it's sort of, sort of if you see words with the hash, you don't, you throw them away. So this is why the E stand, it was there, the E was for extended. Uh, by the way, if you look, so a lot of the L languages are in a, something called the Book of L, where there's a, at least 15 to 20 more acronyms and, and types of languages of this form. Okay, so uh, I, I have a hard time with that as well. All right, so now just to, <laughs> to, uh, to go back to, to, to our result, uh, the language is EDTOL and the complexity is to construct the graph that gives me essentially, so I said you take a symbol, you apply a regular family uh, of morphisms, morphisms. So unlike here, where I just have letters on the edges, what I'm going to have in this graph here, it's going to be maps on, on the edges. But at the more at the at the free semi group level. So now, a tiny bit about the the algorithm. Um, I sometimes talk about the whole algorithm, but I feel that talking about algorithms is a bit like talking about your kids. You care and you love them, but other people are like, oh. so, um, so, so what do we do? We, um, we take equations and actually systems of equations in the free group. There's a, a, a very standard way in the area to transform them into equations of length three, chop them up, uh, introduce new variables. Once you do that, see that any equation of length three can be written as an equation in free semi-group. You need some involution, so you, you, do, you have a, a semi-group, but if you uh, put for a, an inverse, you're going to put that, then you do want in your semi-group to have things like that. So that's what I mean with involution. So everything will be in free monoids with involution. And then we saw we really work there. The whole algorithm is there. Uh, and in order to get the, the reduced words, we need something called rational constraints, which I'm going to talk a bit more later. Uh, and that's very important, otherwise we will not get them in, in reduced words. So, um, if you looked at Makamira's borrow diagrams, you, you were following maps in a group, uh, which will give you the solutions, and that solution will be DTOL. But when you have maps in a group, I mean, all kinds of things will happen, right? You, you don't control the cancellations. There's no way for me with the grammar to deal with cancellations uh, at that level, the group uh, level. So in the free semi-group, everything we do, every time we do something, we say it has to be reduced, it has to be reduced. We sort of have these constraints on, on the go. Um, and uh, more about the algorithm. Well, it's easy to produce the graph, so that, that gives me sort of the regular morphisms. It's a non-deterministic algorithm, so it's not very smart. There's a lot of guesses. I'm guessing my x starts with a, and then I'm guessing my x ends with b, and so you do a lot of guesses, uh, and you bound the size of, of what you're allowed to do. So the graph will be finite because I say, oh, when I get 
to things, equations. So I have my initial equations. I do what, what people call popping. <laughs> so guessing, beginnings and ends of variables and so on. I, if I get to, to a 29n, or if we have a particular constant, then I'm actually not going to go any further. And in the process, so, so this is why the graph is finite. We say things are not allowed to be longer than that. Um, and then, uh, okay, let me just not jump there yet. Um, and why can we say it's finite? It's because the, the compression and recompression, sort of all the English limits. Um, uh, you, you, you're, you're guessing a big part, a big prefix of your word, then the equation becomes huge. And what we do then is compress the strings in a very good way, very careful way, um, <coughs> called block compression, uh, pair compression, and with all kinds of other bells and whistles. Um, so, so we get this graph, it's, as I said, not, not, uh, not, not too long to, to describe. What is really hard <laughs> is to, to show that it's the correct graph. I guess in computer science, a lot of times you have an algorithm proving that it's correct is, is really the harder part. Yeah. Or do you mean correct or complete? I mean, uh, complete. Well, so two things, right? There's the terms. Right? So one thing is that the graph gives only solutions and nothing else, and then it gives all the solutions. Yeah, I, I, but presumably you can check that what you've got actually satisfies things. The question yes, exactly. We do it every step. Actually, <coughs> every time we do something, we know that we are getting a solution, or we're going towards a solution. And there's a way to check absolutely how that that it is a solution. Right, but the completeness is the hard so part. So what is it? Complete and sound. Is that the terms that you need to use? In, com in computer science, there's two words. So that you really have solutions and that you have all the solutions. Yes. Yeah. And, and once you've got that graph, right, so you, you do all these things. Um, so you've done all these things. Every time you're doing some transformations, there's some morphisms. But when you do, a, a, for example, a, a a compression of the form A, A goes to B, well, and then you get that the, your final state in the algorithm, well, that's not a morphism, right? So actually what you do is we've done all this stuff, we got to a final vertex, and we go backwards on the edges to actually describe the solution. So we work <coughs> to compute the graph, and then we start at the end and follow the, the edges backwards to get the solution, because B goes to A, A is a morphism, right? All right, so um, there's a lot to be said here. I mean, the, the proof of correctness is 20 plus 30 pages, I don't know. Um, and, uh, and this is a good approach. It can be used in, it's very robust. The language is, I think, very good language. Uh, it works for right under the Latin groups, so saying that they're EDTOL, and the algorithms as well. Virtually free groups, that's recent to the result. And, um, uh, before I move on, I wanted to say that these languages that you might think are very esoteric are actually uh, very natural for group theory. Uh, in, a, in a recent paper with Murray and then, uh, Mikhail Ferov, we showed that essentially all the languages that have been uh, shown to be indexed in group theory in the last 20 years, we showed that I think every single one of them is EDTOL. So that is actually the right description, I think. This, this sort of, if you know what, what index is, it's, it's, a, it's a kind of a... <laughs> Well, nested stack automaton with, with, uh, or, or, or index grammars. So this, this EDTL is actually algebraically a lot nicer than, than that. Okay, so now the work in progress that I was going to talk about, but um, I decided not to get into any details, is it turns out to, to work for hyperbolic groups as well. Um, so um, the result that's in progress, so we're still writing, it might look slightly different, but this, uh, the, the one thing that we can say is that if you look at, again, solutions in a, in a hyperbolic group, think of words, right? You have words over a generating set. Uh, we try to express this in, in the best possible way, which would be short max normal form. Uh, so this would be DTOL. And then the complexity is, uh, well, uh, what we have right now is non-deterministic space and squared log n. And, and. So now notice that I split it into torsion-free and torsion case. And that's because we get better complexity for torsion free. That's the only reason. And right, so I was going to say more about hyperbolic groups, except that the most important and beautiful work was already done. So the group theory part was done for the torsion free case uh, by Ribs and Stella. So the solutions in the hyperbolic group 
come from solving uh, equations in three groups and for, very fortunately for us, the, the way the solutions end up uh, being given in the hyperbolic groups are quasi-geodesics and we can do a lot of language theory to get from quasi-geodesic to short legs. Uh, if they're not quasi-geodesics, I would be much, much trickier. So in hyperbolic groups, quasi-geodesics are regular for appropriate constants and that's why we can work with this. Uh, and in the torsion case, another amazing, beautiful work, uh, you reduce the solving equations in the, in the hyperbolic group, well, to a bigger virtually free group, and you, you solve equations in the virtually free group and project them onto the hyperbolic group. So it's, it's a very nice way to construct the V and then to, to say what it is, but um, again, that would take quite a bit of time and this is what, what, what has been known and what we, we use as is. Uh, so now the way we, we, we work with this is, uh, so we use descriptions, we use a lot of constraints and, uh, and, and language theory. So I thought, let, let me not bother you anymore with language theory uh, and move on. Tell you a little bit more about constraints, which have turned out to be very important. So what are constraints? Constraints are you have solved a solution, oh, so you solve an equation, and you're asking for your solution to be in a particular set, to look in of a particular form. Right? So here I have, have a set L in G. I'm so, uh, solving an equation with constraints with constraint L means just the solution has to be in L. Okay, so for example, remember my, my little conjugacy problem. Uh, it's easy to find what x is, but you might say, well, no, I only want those solutions which are in this language. So a star means all the powers of a. Right? So in that case, well, the only solution is x equals a. So this is what I mean by constraints. Now, there are a few kinds of, of important constraints. Uh, I think the most known and used is rational. When you're asking, so here I have the definition here, is rational if, uh, so set is rational if it is the image. Um, so here you see, so I have a, a group G generated by set S, take the natural projection. A set L in the group is rational if it comes from a, a regular language in, 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 the, uh, in the generated set. Um, so don't worry about definitions if you don't want to, but saying that solutions must be reduced, that's a, a, a rational constraint. Something else that, that does not appear around quite as much is, is recognizable. Uh, again, uh, uh, let me not get into definitions, but just to say that saying that solutions belong to a finite index subgroup is such a constraint. And there's something that, uh, that in hyperbolic groups you can just work with all the rational constraints, that's too difficult, it doesn't work. So you work with slightly uh, a different versions due to uh, a mining character. Mm -hmm. Right, so some of, these are some of the tools that we can use. And now I want to uh, uh, not talk so much about hyperbolic things anymore and move to the group theory part for uh, a bit more than 10 minutes and show you the power of constraints in a, in a more algebraic setting. So, we use them for languages, but you can use them for other things as well. And so this is uh, another recent result that, that I, uh, I like very much. Can I turn this off? Sorry. Is it, uh, display off? No, no, no. Let's try this one. And the light is... Mm -hmm. So, um, yeah, I've been talking about equations on these groups. One of the things that I'm trying to do is, of course, understand equations in more groups. Um, and while I was thinking about hyperbolic groups and so on, and, and I understood about how it works for virtually free groups, I thought, where else could this be applied? So, um, one of the groups that, that I love is arting groups. And I would like to understand equations in arting groups, although that's pretty hopeless because there's nothing we can understand about all acting groups. So where do you start with acting groups? The friendliest ones are the dihedral acting groups. Okay, so dihedral. So what does, what, what does dihedral stand for? It just says generated by two elements. So the presentation is A, B, A. Right, in, in acting groups, you just have relators that alternate in, in your letters. 
equals ba what whatever it ends. So this is m times and m times here. So there are one related to generator groups uh, that uh, you might know, for example, if you have just uh, the da3, that's just a break group. Right, ABA is equal to DAB. And uh, turns out that uh, you, well, one thing that you typically do or you often do is uh, you do some pizza transformations. I'm just going to do the M is odd case because uh, for, for lack of time. If you do some pizza transformations, uh, hopefully you just believe me. So uh, work with, with, with this presentation, you get the presentation x, y. Uh, equals x squared, well, sorry, x y and x squared is equal to one to the m, which which uh, these are two m torus knot groups. If m is even, then this looks slightly different. Okay, uh, but let's just stick to this. So, what can you say algebraically about these groups, and why why do I think they're nice? Um, so, the algebraic structure. Well, think of what is the center here. Well, you look at this, the center is right either generated by x squared or by y m squared. This is, this is y to the m. So the center of d a m. Again, sticking to m is odd. So, um, um, I mean, it's true for the other case. You just you need to write different things. It's, uh, it's this. The point is it's essentially the integers, right? So now if you quotient by the center, Um, what do you get? Well, you get uh, just uh, do you, I don't know how do you like to write this cyclic or a two-free product cyclic or and if you like to write them z over z two and so on. Um, so what is this saying? Well, it's saying that, that these these little dihedral acting groups uh, have the integer sitting in inside centrally and project onto a free product of finite groups, which is virtually free, right, and in particular hyperbolic. And so from this, uh, well, what can you say? You can, uh, I mean, just think of how you prove that this is virtually free. Well, you, you take, I, well, I don't know what you do, but I took the, the map into the direct product, right, and look at the commutator. So, um, um, okay, so sorry, by the way, so what does this say? Because I want to write it out. So this is saying that these guys are um, central Z extensions of hyperbolic groups. I'm sorry. Okay, one characterization to keep in mind. Now, as a, then, then if you continue to, to uh, right, so if you take the, the, it's virtually what free group, it's f m minus 1, okay? So, so this would be a first characterization. The second, from what I just told you, is that uh, a m is virtually, because this guy uh, rejects onto f m minus 1, if you count the commutators, uh, virtually uh, m minus 1 times the, the z from here. Okay? So, this is the kind of thing that RT people think about when they think of the hydro acting groups. So, this is the thing that, that I sort of came to my mind. Uh, we know how to do virtually free groups. Can we do virtually direct products of, of little free group? Free groups? <laughs> little, or sort of, yeah. So um, what the and the then do is they do twisted equations. In order to solve equations in virtually free groups, they do twisted equations in free groups, which is, to me, a bit of a nightmare because I'm not a topologist. Uh, so I thought maybe that's one, what one needs to do. Uh, fortunately, you don't have to. So, uh, uh, But let me just say the third characterization, which I'll leave as an exercise, which will take me uh, five minutes, which I don't have, is that they're also some most importantly for the talk. You can also see them as being finite index in the direct product of Z with C2 free product CM. So I'll let you think about that. 
So we have three characterizations of, of these groups. Can we solve equations here? Well, it turns out, to my disappointment, uh, that this was already known. So this is a result of the um, from about 2014. So you can solve equations in all essential Z extensions of hyperbolic groups. Okay, so not, not much new there. However, something uh, it's very nice is happening here, which is that, that these guys uh, have a finite index, um, well, here virtually, right? A finite index uh, direct product of a free or hyperbolic groups, however you want to call well, right? The basic ones, and they sit with finite index in another direct product. So this was what gave us the idea to look at when else can we do this. Uh, and, you know, can we say anything useful? And uh, wow, okay. I really thought so the only sport I'm doing is biking, so apparently it doesn't help. Um, all right. Okay, so the, the result we have. Um, is the following. Again, uh, this, this is in the spirit of if you know how to do the equations in a group, what happens with the virtually that group. And so this is the result with uh, Sarah and Derek. So it's essentially just saying that if you have a group G, which contains a direct product of hyperbolic groups of N, N let's call this H finite index. Um, and so all the HI are hyperbolic. Uh, then we can solve equations in G. Uh, equations in equations and, and everything with recognizable constraints. So equations in equations with recognizable constraints. All right, so uh, didn't tell you the recognizable part, but I told you that, that uh, recognizable, you can think of just finite index subgroups as being recognizable, or actually it's more than that, it's unions of cosets of finite index subgroups. So what is the key idea? Again, do you want to lift the information from here? I mean, so, so, so we know what to do with hyperbolic groups. I think everybody can believe quickly that solving equations in direct products will be okay. Um, you cannot do rational constraints for direct products, so there is no hope for that. You need to go to something lower, and that's why we have the recognizable ones. So the idea is, don't go from this guy, where we do understand things, to G, um, but put this guy into another group with finite index. Okay, so this is what I said, this is just algebra. So the key idea is we have uh, G, which we care about, uh, it contains H with finite index, but what we're going to do is we're going to find K. Again, it's an overgroup, finite index overgroup, uh, where we can solve equations and in equations and so on with, ration, with recognizable. So this is where, uh, where I think uh, nice things are happening. All right. So, um, so I'll tell you a bit of uh, how we get the K. And by the way, if we can solve equations here, why can we solve equations in G? Well, um, first of all, look at equations in K where all the coefficients are in G, right? It's a subgroup. So you can do that. And then, when you solve equations in K, put the constraint that all the solutions are in G, and G is a finite index subgroup, and that's recognizable. Okay, so, so this, this works in general. Uh, so now, <laughs> question is, what is K? And here I'm going to tell you a preliminary, um, so I'll run out of time, but just uh, one of the steps in doing this is something that uh, I think some people call 
Kaluzhnin Krasner type result, if, that, if I say it right. Uh, but we don't need the, the whole uh, the power of that. So this appeared already in the 80s. So that's the initial uh, result, and uh, we just sort of changed it a little bit. So it turns out do you, that. Do you mean Kovac or Lovac? No, not Lovac. Ah. Uh, I don't think it's the Lovac. No, I think it's Kovac. But I'll wait and see. It's all right. No, I think this is correct. The other result I mentioned, I might have said the wrong thing. Collusion process? Is this Fletcher growth? Sorry? Is this Fletcher growth or which growth? I, I don't know. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I'll look at the reference. It's from the 80s. Uh, yeah. So, so okay, let me say what would begin. So some of you probably have met it in another context. Um, so if you have a, um, a group A that contains a normal subgroup with finite index, that's a direct product like that. And you need to put a few more conditions. So the AIs um, are a union, so this is a union of conjugacy classes of subgroups. So, uh, so suppose so all these AIs are, 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 are so it's, it's, they're partitioned, this set is partitioned to conjugacy classes, and let's say with, uh, I'll just say the A1 up to AK are the conjugacy representatives of, of these um, um, subgroups, then So, sorry, with A1 up to AK, conjugacy representatives of each of these conjugacy classes, then uh, you can embed A with finite index in, in a direct product of things, W1 up to WK, where each WI Um, or oh, sorry, WJ, it doesn't matter. It's, it's a read product. Uh, the J's, no, I have JJ, okay, contain uh, the AIs from there, AJ, with finite index. Um, and the PJ is just the finite permutation group. So these are not crazy read products, this is the finite part. So PJ is a finite permutation. All right, so we took A containing a direct sum of finite index and we put it into a direct sum uh, above with finite index. Now let me say a few things and then I'll have to stop anyway. Uh, if you look at these WIs, are they good for us? Well, this guy the, so now think of, of our theorem, right? The, in our theorem, these AIs were supposed to be hyperbolic. If you take uh, a finite index overgroup of something hyperbolic, of course it's hyperbolic. Uh, and now if you take a, a read product, a finite read product, well, what is that? It's just a number of copies of your group with a bit of, of, of twisting around. But you can solve equations in, in such finite read products. So in each of these guys, we can solve equations and we can apply the, the recognizable constraints as well. We can work. So all of this can be done, equations and equations and recognizable constraints. Now you should say, but you're lying if something is not right. Yes, the, the, the story is not over because this result says your containing, your group contains a direct sum with finite index, but it's a normal subgroup and also there's a, this funny condition on conjugacy, right, for the, for the groups. And this is where uh, we have a lot more work to do. I mean, the work is in the paper. I'm just saying, yes, the story is not over. You need to, uh, so, so we, um, we, we know that we can do this, but then we find, uh, from the construction we have of the HIs, we find 
a new class of H as a hyperbolic and that, is not, that respect all the conjugacy. Um, so, so essentially there's more work to go from non-normal to the general case. And that's some heavy algebra, only two or three pages, but very condensed. So, uh, so this was, again, to, to, to give the punchline, one place where we can lose constraints to, to a good purpose <laughs> to, to deal with this finite index things. And um, I'll stop here. Thank you, Laura. Questions, comments? It is okay, Kovac. Alexander. Let me it, is Kovac. it is Kovac. Yeah. Where? The yeah. Gross and Lovac is ah. Gross and Kovac. Okay, yeah. sorry. Yeah. Two of his students are in the audience. Uh, <laughs> uh, <laughs> Okay. At least partly, and I'm, I'm one Sorry. of these students. Okay. So that's the reason why we care. Yeah. Okay. Sorry, hang on, hang on. Uh, Alexander, are you finished? I'm finished. Yep. Paul, I think, is the next person. I yield to Paul. You no. yield to Paul? Uh, yeah. Just a, to, a philosophical comment. Yes. You mentioned the time. A, as a result, cited show, actually, space is a natural complexity measure. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. It's, much, it's I, much easier to work with. But is, it, but is it as important? That's <laughs> you could argue that. Yeah, yeah, no, it, it depends, but it's... Okay, it's so, much okay, so one of the great uh, things about Paul's work with Mollerton, this if I can support the lab and call the word seminal, is that the uh, geometric conditions on the Cayley diagram uh, have very natural language theoretic uh, correspondence conditions on, on the language. And I wonder if you see any of that here, or, or um, whether it's even worth looking for. Um, I mean, is there geometry involved here? Um, in which part? In the, in the free group part? In the algorithm, in the languages? Well, I just it's a general question. Uh -huh. You're looking about solutions to equations, right. and you're operating in groups, and, yeah. and there is some geometry, maybe. Um, um, so the, the free group part, I would say, so so I mean, okay, so what our algorithms can do is also say uh, there are s no solutions, there are finitely many, there are well, infinitely many, and so on. Um, we are trying, I mean, I'm, I'm trying to get more information out of them. So, for example, what is the rank of solutions, or, or, or some other things like that. Um, so I, I can't say that at this point I, I see that, or that there is geometry in that. I mean, if, for, for example, the EDTOL languages, yes. yeah. is there any geometry there? I mean, you have, you have um, this set of words, mm -hmm. and uh, which is a solution to some equation, mm -hmm. and it's an EDTOL language, and um, perhaps uh, <laughs> there's some geometric content. I don't know. Uh, I don't see any yet. I mean, it's. I, I think that, that we don't know, for example, which groups have what problem that is EDT or anything like that. Uh, so that's as open as indexed and so on. Yeah. Um, so maybe if, if you try to do that, there will be some geometry in that, it's, okay, it's, yeah. as there was for the context free case. Yeah. Um, other than that, no, there's a geometry in, in the hyperbolic groups, but it's, it's sort of given to us. Yeah. Okay. Anna? I have a very nice question about uh, the result of uh, uh, the Marie and Girardet that you have mentioned that yes. this form of equation in a hyperbolic group uh, yes. uh, uh, can be uh, the solution can be obtained as projection of the system equation in the free group. In other virtually free. Uh, virtually free. Yes. Uh -huh. Are there other groups, uh, uh, groups other than hyperbolic where, where one can have uh, similar statements? Can, uh, are there other classes of groups other than hyperbolic where all, all, all solutions of the system equation can be used to? So, uh, to my knowledge, I mean, unless you here can tell me something else, so uh, there's a really nice work on relatively hyperbolic. Uh, and to my knowledge, the, the torsion case has not been done, and then it's um, so there it's a reduction to more to free products of groups. Uh, I mean, this is depending on parabolic stuff, so there's no exactly this idea I have not seen what, what they do. So it's beautiful, it's amazing what, what they do for the virtually free case um, is, so, so for the torsion free hyperbolic case, um, this canonical, the, these paths that you're using are really uh, things in, in a free group, uh, they're sort of built 
based on the Cayley graph of your hyperbolic group. Okay, so, so you work with, the, with, with your Cayley graph of your hyperbolic group. In, in torsion case, in torsion case, you cannot work directly with your uh, Cayley graph of the hyperbolic group. Uh, so they built another graph. Based Can you on sometimes uh, have a characterization? Let's say so you, you have some procedure to reduce a system of equation in a group to a system of equation in, in the version of a group, for example. And yeah. uh, you know, uh, cannot have a statement like this happens if and only if the group is hyperbolic or something. No, uh, no, no. <laughs> Now, I, I mean, I would, I would love that to be true, but it doesn't seem at this point. I mean, that's another thing that I, I'm, I'm trying to understand. If, if there's virtually something, or reduction between groups, what else can be done? But that's quite unique at this point, I would say. Okay, well, please join me in thanking Laura for a talk. <laughs>